Please be seated. Continue, Council. I believe where we left off, um, you had just indicated the defendant told you that Nicole's car was missing, and I think I just asked you what the license What was that? I no longer have my police report. Oh, let's give it back to you. And you again, Exhibit 18, you are The license plate of the car was 991 T. E F. That's Washington Police. And um, Sergeant Penske, you said that you had further conversation with him. What did he tell you next after talking about the license plate of the car? Um, just that the vehicle was also not present. It was missing. And what else did he say after that? Like this before, and she has no relatives in the area. He went on to tell me that her parents live in Arizona and are en route to help with the situation. While I was still speaking with him, he told me that he has checked her ATM account, but was unable to find out if she had been accessing her account. He also told me that the only credit card she has is an American Express card. Upon being told this, I advised him to contact the creditor to see if they could tell him if, tell him if whether the card is being used. I also told him that he could call me if before I secured today he got this information. Um, how long do you think you were speaking to him that day between the written statement and the oral information he was giving you? I would say I was there at least 30 minutes, maybe as much as 45 minutes. And was that all taking place outside, as you indicated earlier, or were you in your patrol car at some point? Uh, the, the communication with Mr. Peets was all in the parking lot. Um, while I was still technically on the call as far as our CAD dispatch center, um, I did type out the report in my patrol car, but that was away from Mr. Peets. And did his demeanor stay pretty much the same throughout your contact with him that afternoon? It was consistent. Now, when you were still um, at the scene, but after he had left, did you get information that you were to talk to him again? Yes, I was dispatched to a follow-up call, even though I was still on the actual call, um, and it was a request to call or contact Martin Peets. And do you know, had that come in through a 911 call from him asking to speak to you? It must have because it was dispatch that advised me of it. Did you in fact call him back? Yes, I did. <clears throat> and what was that about? If I may refresh my Sure. Notes. He was calling me to let me know that he had contacted American Express and according to them, the last time her American Express card was used was on the 25th. And was that the extent of your contact with him on that day, the 29th? Yes, it was. Did you have any further in-person or uh, telephone contact after that date? I did the next day, I had telephone contact. How did that come about? Uh, again, it was a 911 dispatch to follow up. Um, in this particular instance, I telephoned Martin Peets. And what was the purpose of that? Well, he told me that he had contacted um, uh, the cell phone provider that Nicole had and was also her employer to try to get phone records. And he told me that they were re requiring a subpoena in order to get the information. He also told me that one of their um, managers, uh, I think a human resource manager, wanted a phone call from me. And did you follow up on that information he gave you? Yes, I called. Uh, her name was Susan, and I called at the number I was given, and I ended up leaving a voice message for that person. And did you end up at some point having additional phone contact with the phone company? Yes, I left my phone number, and I received a call. It wasn't from the Susan employee. It was a male that called me. Okay. Did you have any other No, after the conversation on the 30th, I wrote a follow-up, and that was my last involvement in this case. Thank you, Sergeant. I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you. Sergeant, my name is David Allen. I'm the attorneys for uh, David Martin Keats. I uh, just have a few follow-up questions. Uh, first, you've already told us that um, David Peets's demeanor during your meeting with him on, I believe it was the 29th, was appropriate given the circumstances. That is correct. And you actually wrote that in your report, yes? I did. 
And you wrote also, while he was calm, he showed concern for the well-being of his wife. That's correct. Okay. So on the 29th, when you spoke with him, were you aware that he had spoken over the phone with another detective, Detective Binkley, I believe, from Snohomish County, the day before? I don't believe I knew at the time. I think I learned later. At that time, I don't recall having that knowledge. Okay. But you did find that out later on, right? Yes, I did. And with missing person reports, oftentimes people are told to call back the next day or the day after that or, you know, at some point in time as things progress, right? I mean, the relative of the missing person. That's correct. By that, and let me go back a step, sometimes right at the start, based on typical procedure, at least back in 2006, if someone called dispatch or 911, say, a few hours after somebody was missing, dispatch, unless they had some very specific information, dispatch might say, well, wait 12 or 24 hours, something like that. That's not something that would come from dispatch. It would have to come to an officer, and an officer back then, that did occur. Okay. And then after giving an initial statement, say, over the phone, the person has the option to call back again and try to get some more information either to or from the authorities. Is that right? Absolutely. And so when David contacted you on the 29th, he provided you with information regarding Nicole and her being missing and background information about her. Is that right? Yes, he did. And during that meeting, you said that you had David fill out a statement, write out a statement with information about Nicole and some of her background and the fact that she was missing. Yes? That's correct. And that was a statement that you read to the court, and it's been marked as Exhibit 19. That is it. And when you read it to the court, there were a few things you perhaps couldn't understand or discern. I'm going to hand it back to you and ask you a question now. Okay. So the first line says, last time I saw slash spoke to my wife, Nicole Peets was, and it looks like there's a little squiggle. It looks like an S on its side. Is that right? Yes. And then that's 12A Friday. That A would seem to be AM, right? That was my interpretation. And do you know if, at least in mathematics or science, the little squiggle on its side means around or about or approximately? Do you know that signal? I can't say that I know that. Okay. It doesn't surprise me. Okay. And then down at the bottom, let's see, it looks like he finished the report, and there's a space there, or the statement, there's a space, and then there's some description below that. That's correct. And it would seem to me that it would be standard operating procedure in police work for the relative of the missing person to give a description. Is that a fair statement? That would be fair to say, yes. Because oftentimes there's descriptors that the relative can give that might not be available on standard databases, like, say, a driver's license database, right? This would be information that's potentially more up-to-date versus driver's license info, correct? Okay. And things like scars or things that are under clothes and so forth, that might not be in the driver's license database. That would not be. That would not be. And an example here could be the large scar on the right hip, right? That probably wouldn't be in the database. That would not. And also a tattoo of an Asian, and then we can't really read that, but on her tailbone, that obviously also would not be something that would be typically in a law enforcement database unless somebody, let me go back a step, if a person has never had any adverse contacts with the police, that's information that would probably not be in a law enforcement database, right? Yeah, if they've not been arrested and booked, that would not make it into any database that law enforcement would have access to. So on the 29th, you met with David. You indicated at 15, 11 hours, that's 3, 11 p.m.? That's correct. Initially. And then he called you back over the phone later on in the day. I guess we don't have the time in your report. Is that right? No, I do not have the time. It was still while I was on the call, the original. Okay. And by on the call, by that time you had left his residence. Is that right? That's correct. So he called dispatch, or at least 911, and they called you and said, Mr. Peets wants to talk to you, right? That's how it went. Do they patch you in together or do you call them back? 
now it's just a, a call, and then I use my cell phone to call. And that's where you had some follow-up information with regard to the American Express card. That's correct. And then he next called you, um, or at least you heard that he had called 911 and asked to speak to you. The next day would have been January 30th at about 1226 hours or 1226 p.m. Yes, that's correct. And that's where he gave you, I believe, the name of the HR person at Singular. That's correct. And he also said that he had attempted to get phone records, but he wasn't able to do so. That's correct also. Okay. And then that's when you made a phone call to a person by the name of Suzanne, who you understood was the HR person. Yes? That's correct. And as a result of that, or, or at least maybe not as a result, but you got a message back from a security person at uh, Singular with some information regarding the use of um, usage on Nicole Pizza's cell phone. That's yes? correct. When you went out to um, see Mr. Peets, um, you indicated that was a, Mr. Peets's uh, residence, which was a condo. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's uh, somewhat of a, a condo development, I take it. There were many condos there. Yes, it used to be a large, well, it's still large, but it was an apartment complex that then changed over to becoming condos. Did you um, go into David Peets's condo? Okay, you didn't ask to go in, right? I didn't ask. So there was never any, you know, I don't want you to go in, anything like that? No, okay. I never asked. Uh, did you ask to go into the garage there uh, that belonged to his, his condo? No, I did not. Okay. As far as David's uh, getting back to you with fel uh, cell phone information, was that something you asked David to do, or is that something he did on his own? I don't recall. Okay. I don't know. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm your testimony in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. It's uh, George Rodney Schneider. It's S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. And where do you live? I live in uh, Surprise, Arizona. Are you retired or working? I'm retired. What are you retired from? I was a business owner. In what area? In the, in the Seattle area. Okay. And what type of business was that? It was an industrial shelving business. And are you married? I am married. To whom? To Gail Schneider. And how long have you been married to Gail? 
since uh, January 1st, 1998. Do you know or did you know someone named Nicole Peets? I'm sorry? Did you know someone named Nicole Peets? Yes, I did know Nicole Peets. And how did you know her? She was Gail's daughter, my stepdaughter. Um, how well would you say you knew Nikki before you married Gail? I didn't know her real well. She wasn't living with Nikki out there with Gail at the time, so she would just stop by occasionally, and I would uh, got to know her that way. Okay, she was a young adult at that point. I'm sorry? She was a young adult at that point. Yes, she was. Um, once you got married with Gail, how often would you say that you got to see her? See Nikki. I'm sorry, my hearing is I'm not sorry. what it should be. So, okay. once you married Gail, how often would you say you saw Nikki? Mm. Quite often, probably once a week, and minimum once a month. Um, I would like to take you back to late January 2006, specifically Sunday, the 28th of January, and I'm going to show you a calendar for context. The 29th. This is State's Exhibit 2, which is in evidence. So can you take a look at it and orient yourself? Yes, it was on the 29th. Okay, Sunday the 29th Sunday that we're talking 29th. about? Okay. Where were you on Sunday the 29th? Uh, I was uh, at home in, uh, in surprise. It was in the morning. Okay. And where was Gail? Gail had gone to church. And I had gone to 7 o'clock church and was back, and <laughs> she had gone to 9 o'clock mass, and okay. so she was gone. Okay. So you're in Arizona? In at Arizona. Your home in Arizona? That's correct. Did you receive a phone call that morning? I did receive a phone call that and morning. who was it from? From David Peets. Okay. And had you met David Peets before? Oh, yes. Through Nikki? She was Nikki's husband. And what was the first thing he said when you answered the phone? Uh, he said, Nikki's gone missing. Did he ask you anything about whether she might be with you or Gail? Did not. Did not. Did he tell you what had happened or what had led up to that? Uh, well, I, I guess we had an exchange like, uh, what do you mean she's missing or whatever? And uh, uh, David immediately went into uh, his story of uh, of how I guess it was Friday night was the last time he saw her mm -hmm. and he was supposed to meet her Saturday night at some friend's house and when he got to the friend's house uh, Nikki was not there uh, he said he had got home on Friday night uh, late and Nikki was sleeping so they had a mumbled exchange of some sort and uh, he went to bed, and the next morning, uh, she had been, uh, she had left already. And did he talk about whether he had done anything to try to locate her at that point? He he said that he had sent some emails, and and I don't know whether he said he had called, but he apparently contacted some of uh, Nikki's friends or some of her friends. At least this is what he told me mm -hmm. on. Uh, on a Saturday evening. Okay. So what happened when Gail got back from church? When Gail got back from church, I said, uh, you better sit down. I says, uh, David just called and said Nikki's missing. And what happened then? And she immediately called David. And they talked? And they talked, yes. Okay. And then what happened after that? Uh, we. Uh, got ourselves a, a flight of, on uh, United Airlines and uh, departed for Seattle uh, that same morning. When you arrived in Seattle, um, did you rent a car, take a cab? Rented a car. Okay. Where did you go first? We first went to uh, uh, the condominium where David and Nicole lived. And was the defendant there? Yes, he was. And. When you arrived, um, did you go inside? Yes. Okay. And what happened first when you got inside? Where did you go? Well, the first thing you know, when he got inside is uh, he took us into the, the bathroom and started pointing out uh, 
uh, and explaining that the wedding ring was there because they had uh, taken to not wearing their wedding rings. Uh, there was a, a large pile of uh, freshly washed clothes uh, laying on the floor and uh, he was standing by them and he was picking them up and sorting through them and he says, I can't imagine what she was wearing because everything she owns is here. Okay, did he say anything else about what was in the bathroom? Uh, yes, he showed us uh, an empty prescription bottle. Uh, apparently it was a, a prescription of painkillers that uh, uh, Nikki had been taking because she'd been, had some uh, severe back pains. Okay. Did he mention anything about a retainer that she wore at night? Uh, he said, did say that the, they had that she had been wearing her retainer okay. from time to time. Out in public? Out in public. Okay. And was that supposed to explain why it wasn't in the house? Pardon? Was that supposed to explain why it wasn't in the house? Your Honor, objection. I guess it was, yes. Your Honor, objection. That asks for speculation on his part. Okay. Well, I can, I'll rephrase it. Okay. Um, what was that statement in response to, or did he volunteer that statement? He volunteered that statement. Did you ask about looking in the garage? Yes. Uh, I asked, uh, David, I said, let's go look in the garage, see if there's anything, any clue of anything that's going on. And he was adamant that uh, we were not to go look in the garage. He says, I've looked in there, there's nothing there. And I pursued that a little later again, and he was adamant that there was nothing in the garage. Okay. At some point, um, did you go to visit the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office? Yes. And uh, who was that with? Uh, Gail and myself and uh, David went to the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office on Tuesday afternoon to file a missing re uh, person's report. Okay. Can you describe um, what the defendant's demeanor was like during that meeting, how sort of he was emotionally acting? Uh, I guess I would have to say he was just making a report. Uh, didn't seem to be emotional one way or the other. He was very just kind of uh, making a report. Okay. Now, the whole time that you were in Seattle, how long did you stay? I stayed in Seattle, uh, I believe, until Thursday, okay. from Sunday to Thursday. And for the period of time that you were in Seattle, um, did he ever indicate to you that he was upset or worried about Nicole? Nothing that I saw, no. Um, so what did you do the rest of the time that you were in the city? When I was in the city, uh, you know, the concern was that Mickey's car was missing. And so uh, David had sent me to look around Green Lake, asked me if I would go around Green Lake because he said that's where she liked to go. Okay. So I took the rental car and I spent the better part of the day driving around Green Lake seeing if I could find uh, Nikki's car and uh, had no success, obviously. Okay. Did you go anywhere else, drive anywhere else? Yes, I uh, took it upon myself to uh, follow the route uh, that Nikki would have taken, or a logical route that Nikki would have taken to go to her meeting that she was supposed to attend on uh, Saturday morning. In Renton? In Renton. Okay. So you drove down to Renton? So I drove down to Renton and uh, uh, we, for some reason we thought Nikki was supposed to meet some friends for coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just drove down that route and stopped at every Starbucks and every coffee shop and drove through parking lots and, uh, and spent a good part of the day driving and uh, the route all the way down to Renton. and then. Uh, back and again having no success. Okay. Um, how about in the condominium complex itself? Uh, in the condominium complex, uh, uh, Gail and I had taken some pictures of some flyers that had been printed up mm -hmm. and we walked through the entire condominium uh, complex uh, knocking on doors asking if anyone had seen Nikki and uh, again uh, a lot of people knew Nikki and uh, because she was a very friendly uh, young lady, uh, but uh, nobody could give us any help as to where she was. Um, so did you actually post flyers as well? Yes, uh, a lot of people went out and posted flyers, including myself. Uh, uh, groups went in different directions and hit all the convenience stores, and, and uh, I forget the area that I went, but I went out for a day by myself uh, hanging up flyers. Did the defendant help you put up flyers at any time? No. Okay. 
So far as you know, did he ever go out searching for her or her car? To my knowledge, no. Did he ever tell you about someone offering to use a helicopter to look for Nicole? No, I do not recall that. Now, did the defendant tell you if they were having any problems in their marriage? He didn't allude to any, no. Did he offer you a theory of what might have happened or what he thought might have happened to her? No. Okay. Do you remember him discussing her pills? Uh, yes. Uh, the pills, the, the prescription bottle was empty. Mm -hmm. And uh, in talking about it, uh, what, you know, Gail said, uh, okay. I remember. Uh, let me back up because we can't talk about what other people said. Okay. So what uh, I'm asking you is, did the defendant say in anything to you yeah. about Nicole's pills? Yes, because Bill Pottle, Bill, Bill, pill bottle mm -hmm. was empty. Uh, he suggested that possibly she took the pills and went out on, out on the street to sell them. Okay. Did he name a particular street? Uh, Second Avenue. Did you learn at some point about a call that had been made to the 24-hour fitness where the defendant worked on the Saturday that Nikki disappeared? Yes, I understand it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And what did the defendant tell you about his whereabouts when that call came in? Well, he said that he probably was in the equipment room because when the call came in, uh, he didn't hear the page. He had been paged? He had been paged. Whoever answered the phone apparently paged him and he did not answer the phone because uh, uh, he was in the equipment room. And couldn't hear it. And couldn't hear it. Okay. Was there discussion, did you have discussion with him about checking out, talking to the receptionist who would have taken that call? Uh, yes, that was quite extensive. Uh, after he found out, uh, we, for all better, lack of a better word, we begged David to see if he could find out uh, if the phone call had come in, whether it was uh, a female or a male or who it was that had called him. Okay, and when you talk to him about that, would he ever act on it? Well, he would, he would always go into the second room, which is like a little office. It was a second bedroom in the condo that they used as an office. Mm -hmm. And he would go in there and come out a few minutes later and say uh, she wasn't available or she was on break. And I would say that this happened over a couple of days, probably four or five times where we encouraged David to pursue that, that individual who had answered the phone and get more information about it. And uh, okay. each now, time uh, he came back with some reason that uh, he couldn't get a hold of her. Okay. Now, during this period while she was missing, did you try to call her? I tried to call her repeatedly. And how did that go? Her phone went right to voicemail. Why were you trying to call her? Hope, hope that she would answer it. At some point, um, did you learn that her body had been found? Uh, I, I learned that a body had been found. I had gone back to Phoenix. Okay. And uh, Tanya called me and said that there was a report in the paper that a woman's body had been found. Okay. And get, was Gail still in Seattle? Gail was still in Seattle. Okay. And so I immediately went to the airport, came back up to be with Gail and with, uh, with the family. And uh, when I got back up here, I called the medical examiner's office. Excuse me, I called the medical examiner's office from Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, yes, they told me that a woman's body had been found, but they hadn't identified her. And then what did you tell them? And I told them that I was coming to Seattle, and for fear that it was Nikki, I said, if you decide, if you find out that it was Nicole, please call only me so that I can be the one that tells the family. And at some point, did they call and confirm that with you? And well, pardon? Did they call and confirm that with you? They called. That was they called on Tuesday. Uh, that would have been uh, the, the day after her body was found. Uh, they had gotten the dental records, and they called me. We were at the Spring Hill Suites in Bothell, mm -hmm. and they called me there and con confirmed that it was uh, Nicole. Okay. If I get it just a moment. I have nothing else.
Your Honor, we have no questions of this witness. You may step down. Thank you. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm your testimony on this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And does she have a... Yes, she had requested if she could stand. If you wish to stand up or sit, you can sit for a while, you can stand for a while, anything to try to make your back comfortable, okay? Thank you very much. All right, have a seat. Pass me the mic. Maybe we can take the microphone off. What's that? Maybe we can take the microphone off. Oh, here, I can hold it. Actually, sit. You okay, Ann? Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you need to stand, just go ahead and do it. You don't need to say anything, okay? Thank you. Can you state your name and why don't you spell both your first and last name for us? My name is Gail Schneider. Gail is G-A-E-L. And Schneider is S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. And where do you currently live, Ms. Schneider? In Arizona. And are you married? Yes, I am. What's your husband's name? Rod Schneider. And Ms. Schneider, was Nicole Peach your daughter? Yes. Do you have other children? Yes, I do. Tanya Zerker. Which one of them was older? Tanya. By how many years? By five years. And my understanding is your husband, Nicole and Tanya's stepfather? Yes. Yes. When did he come into their lives? Well, both girls were already grown and on their own by the time I met Rod. Is Nicole's biological father, did he pass away? He passed away several, many years ago. Now, do you remember what year you moved down to Arizona? I think it was 16 years ago. Okay, that's a while. Yeah. How much contact would you and Nicole have when you lived in Arizona and she lived up here? Well, I would only come up about once a year and she would usually come down once a year. We took them on trips. Took Nicole and David to Hawaii a couple of times, but I talked to her every day. Okay. So you saw her in person at least twice a year, but talked on the phone frequently? Yes. Would you generally be the one to call her or would she call you? She called me mostly, but I called her as well. And you obviously mentioned David, that was her husband. Yes. And you said you took a couple of trips with them? Yes. Is it fair to say that you probably saw Nicole more than you saw her husband? Yes. When you would talk to her frequently, just about kind of what was going on in their lives, what would you generally talk about? Well, yes, but Nicole and I had tennis in common and the love of the ballet. And so if there was a tennis match on, we might be on the phone for three hours just talking about what a shot bomb or something like that. But generally just her work or her husband or her pets. She had two cats and a dog and 
She absolutely loved her pets. So they were all, always in the conversation. Um, did you <clears throat> typically talk at a certain time of day, or was it any time? Did it vary? Well, basically, she called me at 4.30 when she got home from work. Okay. Um, did you at some point assist Nicole and the defendant um, in purchasing a condominium? Yes. How did you assist them? I... I had money from the home that her dad and I, that we raised the girls in, and I had put $30,000 away for each girl. And um, I gave it to Nicole for a down payment on the condo, not for any other reason. And did it get used for the condo they moved into? Only 18000 was put down on the, on the condo. Where did the rest go? Um, David paid off his yeah. car. I beg your pardon? Just hold on. Let the judge hold Sustain. It's sustained unless she has some information from the I'll, I'll ask another question. So you were aware that only a portion of it had been used for the condo? Not until after Nicole was dead. Okay. And the realtor told me what they put down. Okay, hold on. You can't talk about what other people say. So let's just move on, on from that, that topic. Objection, you were about to make <laughs> let's move on from that topic. Um, was this money, was this the condominium that they moved into in late 2005? Yes. Okay, so that was the time period that we're talking about. Yes. And did you ever actually come up and see the condominium that they moved into? Yes. And do you recall when that was that you did that? Yes, it was December of, of 05. Um, I, I, 16th, 17th, and 18th, I believe. And was that your yearly visit up here? No, it was an extra visit. I wasn't going to see her at Christmas, and so I wanted to, I wanted to see her, or I wanted to see both my girls, and so I came up to see them for our Christmas visit pre-Christmas. And where did you stay? Were you staying with one of your daughters? Yes, Nicole and I both stayed at Tanya's um, home. Mrs. Schneider, did you at some point? learn uh, that your daughter was missing? Yes. When, um, when was that? Sunday, January 29th. Were you in Arizona? Yes. I was, I was at church, and my husband, for some reason, had gone earlier. Um, it was just one of those things that I don't know why, but when I came home from church, he said, Gail, sit down. And I said, well, why? And he said, David called and Nikki's gone missing. What did you do at that point? I said, what do you mean gone missing? And I called David right away. And he had the exact same spiel to me that he had to my husband. What, I guess when you first called him, what did he say? Nikki's gone missing. Did he ask you before he said that if you had heard from her or seen no. her? No. So once you learned that, was this in the morning or afternoon that Sunday? It was. It would, couldn't have been later than 10 because we got on an airplane within an hour. I knew that Nikki wouldn't just go away. So we got on an airplane and we were up there by the afternoon. Let me let me ask you a question. The last time, when was the last time you had seen her in person? Was that the December visit? December 18th. And when do you think you had last spoken to her on the phone prior to that? The Thursday before. For some reason, I didn't call her on Friday, and I didn't call her on Saturday. W was there anything that stood out or unusual about that call, or was it just a normal phone call? On Thursday, it was a normal phone call. Were you aware um, of an of a eight-year sobriety anniversary coming up for her? Absolutely. That was to be that January... January 28th. Had she told you whether she was intending to attend that? Yes. She was um, not only attending it, but she was meeting Barbara and and Dave, a, a guy from, um, from AA, and they were planning a social. And so she was meeting them at 1130. Um, what time did you arrive um, up in Seattle in the afternoon, or Linwood in the afternoon, or was it evening? That's no, it was afternoon. And did you immediately go to the condominium? Yes. And what did the defendant say to you when you first arrived? 
When he opened the door and he's walking us back to her bathroom, he said, lately we haven't been wearing our wedding rings, and Nikki's been wearing her mouth guard when she goes out. And then when we got to the bathroom, he showed us an empty bottle of pills. Did he tell you when he had last seen her? Yes, he said that he had come home at midnight, that she'd awakened and asked him if he wanted anything to eat, and he had said no, and he said that was the last time he saw her. We heard a little testimony from your husband, but what did you and your husband do to try to find Nicole that week? Just general categories of things you think he did. We got in our car and drove back and forth from their condo to the AA, where she would have gone for her AA meeting. And, you know, in all the streets around, we were just looking for her car. Did you go post any flyers anywhere during that week? Oh, yes, yes. Well, all the people from work had search parties going, and they were doing flyers, I believe. But Tanya and I asked all the people in the radius of their condo if we could put a flyer in their window. And most of the people let us put a flyer in their window. Okay. And you did that as well? I beg your pardon? You placed flyers all over? Yes. Did the defendant ever talk to you about a friend offering to hire a helicopter to drive over the routes Nicole may have gone? No, he didn't. At some point, Mr. Snyder, did you learn that your daughter's body had been found? Yes. And I don't want to make you talk about that. I do want to talk a little bit about the funeral. Obviously, you attended the funeral, and I assume the defendant was there. I beg your pardon? I assume the defendant was at the funeral of Nicole as well. Yes, he was. Did he make any comment to you in relation to Nicole's death at that funeral? You know, he did. It was a really strange thing, but he put his arms around me and said, I didn't think you'd take it so hard. Was that before or after the funeral or during it? You know, I don't remember. I just know we were in this little house that was behind the church that we were allowed to have our privacy in. Where the family was allowed to gather? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. I don't have any other questions for you right now. Counsel, may I?